morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Angelica Hakume. I am the director of the Office of Small Island Developing States, Least Developed Countries, and Landlocked Developing Countries at FAO. And it is my pleasure to be your moderator today and to welcome you to the fourth SID Solutions Dialogue. I would like to extend my appreciation to the ambassadors and government representative of Bahamas, Cabo Verde, Republic of Fiji, and, and Samoa, and to the representatives of the permanent missions of Antigua Barbuda, Barbados, the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, the Republic of Nauru, Trinidad and Tobago, and also the United States for joining us today in person in Geneva. I would also like to extend my appreciation to the permanent representative of Samoa, uh, for his presence in our liaison office in New York, as well as the permanent representative Solomon Islands, who is joining us from Brussels. We began this dialogue series in February last year as a joint effort between the FAO liaison offices in Geneva, Brussels, and New York with the Office of Small Island Developing States, Least Developed Countries, and Landlocked Developing Countries. We have already had three dialogues on the key outcomes of the SID Solutions Forum, Building Resilience, of SIDS agri-food systems and the state of fisheries and agriculture in SIDS. Today, we will discuss the outcomes of the UNF Triple C COP27 and its implications for SIDS. With around 65 million inhabitants, SIDS account for only 1% of CO2 emissions and yet are the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, posing an existential threat Fisheries, tourism, and agriculture contribute significantly to the economy, sectors whose vulnerability and fragility is making it more challenging for them to produce sufficient food to meet their population needs. We have put together an exciting program for you. We will begin with opening remarks from His Excellency Fatou Munava Opulu, Chair of the Alliance of Small Island Developing States, uh, EOSIS, permanent representative, ambassador, permanent representative of Samoa to the United Nations, and His Excellency Mose Kuni Mose, ambassador and head of the mission of Solomon Islands to the European Union. Next, we will move to our panel speakers. A hearing from Zitini Old Dada, deputy director of the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment at FAO who will provide an overview of COP27 outcomes relevant to agri-food systems, food security and nutrition and their implication for SIDS. He will be followed by Mr. Akilalanji Gulab, Assistant Director of the Food and Agricultural Research Extension Institute of Mauritius. Mr. Gulab will offer his reflections on what Mauritius is doing to combat climate change in the agri-food sector and how the COP27 decisions can support Mauritius efforts. We will then move to Mr. Zachary Phillips, Fellow 2022 of the Alliance of Small Island Developing States, AOSIS from Antigua and Barbuda, who will share with us uh, critical areas of climate action support for uh, for SIDS, building on his experience and advancing their interests. Last but not least, we will hear from Ms. Christine Müller, Policy Officer of the European Commission, Directorate for Climate Action, DG Klima, and responsible for climate finance in the European Commission in Brussels. Ms. Müller will reflect on the role of the European Union in enhancing climate finance and ensuring the effective implementation of the new decisions with a focus on SIDS. We will then have 35 minutes for questions and answers. Participants in the room, we would ask you to kindly raise your hands to request the floor and those of us in Zoom, or those of you in Zoom, I should say, kindly place your questions in the question and answer module. Uh, last but not least, to conclude our event today, we will hear from Marielena Semedo, Deputy Director General at FAO, and Ms. Semedo will help us summarize some of the key takeaways from the presentations, the Q&A, and offer her insights on the topics discussed. Before we begin, allow me to provide some housekeeping rules and information for today's session. Uh, the webinar will last approximately 90 minutes and will be recorded. Uh, finally, keep your microphones muted if you are joining us online. And we encourage you to please post your questions in the Q&A module 
and we will do our best to address them during the question and answer session. And with that, I now welcome you once again to the Ford SID Solutions Dialogue, and we'll pass the floor to His Excellency Fatumenava Owopulu, Ambassador and Chair of the Alliance of Small Island Developing States. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Angelique. And uh, can I say good afternoon, good morning, uh, wherever you are? Um, excellencies and uh, colleagues, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure for me uh, to join you today uh, for this uh, Four Sets uh, Solution Dialogue uh, organized by uh, FAO. Uh, let me also thank FAO for the invitation to uh, AOSIS to be part uh, of this conversation today. I think it's an extremely important process and hopefully this will also contribute to uh, the upcoming uh, fourth sits conference uh, next year that will be held uh, in uh, Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, as you are all aware, uh, global events, uh, including COVID-19, uh, the debt crisis, and the escalating impact of climate change have placed uh, small island development states in a very precarious situation, more so than ever before. And as we strive to achieve uh, the lofty aspiration that we have all set for ourselves in various international uh, frameworks, with the objective of leaving no one behind, it is important to put those furthest behind First, according to the latest IPCC report, widespread loss and damage from slow on said event, such as reductions in water availability, agricultural production and fisheries yields, disease spread, economic damages, classier retreat, and sea level rise are already happening and affecting vulnerable communities such as SIT disproportionately. While we have contributed the least to the problem, we still need to respond to the impact, which reduces the availability of financial resources for development and impedes national economic growth. In this context, we welcome the strong outcome from COP27, particularly the decision to explore funding arrangement for responding to loss and damages associated with the adverse effects of climate change. As you are all aware, this is a historic achievement that culminated through decades of advocacy by small island development states. During 2023, the transition committee must operate in a smart, effective and efficient manner that gives at a minimum the required momentum for operationalizing the UNFCCC's new and distinct loss and damage fund by COP28. Some of you will be aware that the first meeting of the transition committee uh, was held uh, at the end of uh, last uh, month. But these, uh, you know, they dealt primarily uh, with procedural issues um, and they have not really uh, gone into the meat or the, the greater details of their uh, terms of reference. I think we all support the work of the TC, but I think given time constraint, they have to have their report ready by COP28. This is gonna be a huge uh, task and uh, we wish them well. The Sharm El Sheikh joint program work on implementation of climate action on agriculture and food security is another important outcome 
for safeguarding food security and addressing the particular vulnerability of food production systems to the adverse impacts of climate change. We must look at meaningfully and effective ways to translate the recommendations from the workshop under the Coronavia uh, joint work into concrete and urgent action. Indeed, during this decade of action, it is important to explore practical solutions that complement strategies aimed at long-term resilience. In doing so, we must draw from lessons learned and scale up best practices and new and new emerging opportunities. This is even more crucial as we are now looking towards ahead towards the fourth international conference on SITS to take place in Antigua and Barbuda next year. Through dialogue and deliver and partnership during the next year, we hope to secure some strong deliverable at the fourth conference that will move things forward at the pace that is required. I encourage all stakeholders from the international community to engage in the preparatory process, including the regional and inter-regional preparatory meetings to advance these critical discussions ahead of the conference. Before I conclude, I would like to thank the FAO once again for their continuous support of SITS in advancing our priorities, including through the SITS solution platform. As we embark on our more ambitious development journey next year, we hope to strengthen our collaborative efforts, particularly in the areas of sustainable ocean management, fisheries, food security, and nutrition. I look forward to the rich discussion ahead today and I thank you all for being here this afternoon, this morning. Thank you, and Faftai Telelava. Excellency, thank you for these opening remarks on behalf of AOSIS, which I won't intend to summarize because I will not do them justice. Um, but I, you did stress uh, that to leave no one behind, we have to focus on those most behind, and, and that here is the most vulnerable, such as SIDS. Uh, we look forward to tapping into opportunities to strengthen our collaboration uh, through the SID Solutions platform and also uh, in the lead up to COP28 and the 2024 SIDS conference. I will now pass the floor to His Excellency M Moses Kuni Mose, Ambassador and Head of Mission of the Solomon Islands to the European Union, for his opening remarks. Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator, Excellencies, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Brussels. Thank you, FAO, for organizing this Global Seeds Solutions Dialogue and for inviting me to make this brief opening remark. I will focus on two levels. First, I will be providing a global perspective from the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States, the OACPS. And secondly, a regional perspective from the Blue Pacific, where I come from. I was privileged to have chaired the OACPS Seeds Forum for the last 12 months. And it is a consultative and subsidiary organ of the OACPS and brings together the 39 seats of the 79 members of the OACPS to determine and coalesce around common priorities and interests, including the need for stronger climate action. For OACPS seeds, food security is a key priority, especially as countries grapple with the ongoing climate crisis 
and now the impacts of the Ukraine war on global food, fertilizer, and food and fuel supplies. In multiple ways, climate change is a major driver of food insecurity in OECPS seeds, undermining efforts to improve access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food. To respond, the OECPS has completed a feasibility study for a food systems transformation mechanism and efforts are underway to consult members and partners to establish a food systems transformation mechanism appropriate for the OECPS and also to inform the global food agenda. This initiative is complemented by the OECPS Strategy Plan of Action on Fisheries and Aquaculture 2030. Furthermore, a key priority of the OECPS Seeds Forum is to assist its members to access climate finance. A resource mobilization conference is planned for OECPS Seeds in 2023. In preparation for this event, the OECPS Seeds Forum is developing an OECPS multidimensional vulnerability and resilience index, an OECPA state of climate finance, access report, and OECPS NDCs fact sheets. Excellencies and colleagues, if I may now tend to offer some specific regional perspectives. Pacific peoples continue to grapple with increasing levels of food insecurity and malnutrition with rising incidences of adults suffering obesity and malnutrition cited as the key risk factor for the burden of non-communicable diseases. For example, our children's nutritional status is a major concern with both extremes of malnutrition, of moderate to severe wasting and moderate to severe overweight manifested in children under five years of age. To put this into context, first, while 50 to 70% of Pacific peoples depend on agriculture or associated activities for their livelihoods, agricultural productivity has been steadily, has seen steady decline due to climate change impacts. Land land degradation and biodiversity loss. Secondly, coupled to this, 50 to 90% of our population are highly dependent on coastal fisheries and resources for health, for healthy food protein, micronutrients and livelihoods. But these resources are also experiencing significant decline due to climate change impacts and harvesting pressures. And thirdly, Pacific Seeds extreme isolation from, market, from markets presents additional challenges to ensuring cost efficient trade in goods and services that underpin our, our food systems. So how can we address these challenges? Firstly, OACPS seeds, which includes all Pacific seeds, require increased support for building resilience, timely access to scaled up climate finance and targeted development assistance that is programmatic in and commensurate with the country systems is needed. Secondly, interdisciplinary approaches to the development of more sustainable, inclusive and resilient solutions to seeds food insecurity challenges must be given high priority due to the interconnectedness and inextricable links between food and the global climate, biodiversity, energy 
and financial crisis. Thirdly, seeds health, livelihoods, and food system outcomes are heavily influenced by global trade systems and local food environments, impacting overall food and nutrition security. A combination of improved food governance, education programs, and incentives for sustainable and healthy and health, healthy food can help transition diets. Investment in food safety infrastructure and legislation to facilitate access of seeds food producers to markets is also needed. Finally, as we approach the review of the SAMO pathway, we should reflect and reimagine the new development approaches to address food insecurity and genuine and durable partnerships. I hope today's dialogue should inform regional and intra-regional preparations for the fourth International Seeds Conference to take place in Antigua and Barbuda in 2024. Thank you very much. Message, um, particularly for um, briefing us on the situation of Pacific SIDS, as well as providing some thoughts on how to address the major challenges faced by Pacific SIDS, as well as briefing us on the efforts of the OACPS um, to transform agri-food systems and for resource mobilization. It has given us much food for thought. We now turn to Zituni Oldada, Deputy Director of the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment at FAO. Zituni, could you please share with us how agri-food systems were reflected in the COP27 decisions and the initiatives and what these may mean for SIDS? Over to you, Zituni. Uh, thank you very much, Angelica, and um, greetings, excellencies, and, and dear colleagues, and, and everyone joining us for, for this webinar. Uh, and thank you to, to my colleagues from the, the offices of, of Geneva, Dominique Bourgeon, and the office of Brussels, Rachel al Khafaji, and also uh, the office in New York, um, Chud Guangzhou. Thank you for this initiative and, and series of webinars that allow us to share our work and achievements with um, FAO members and other colleagues at large and really um, appreciate you, your feedback in, in working together and continuing this agenda. I'll take you through um, some of the achievements that we uh, made at, at COP27 and, and the relevance to um, seeds in, in particular. So we'll take you through these in, in the next um, uh, few minutes. Um, and if you could just confirm that you can see my slides, Angelica. Can you see my slides? We can see the sound. No, you can, you should put it full screen. Now. Yes, full screen is what you needed. We can see the slides, you just put it full. On view. Okay, I've got them on, on full screen. Somehow it's not working. Let me start again. Hopefully it will work this time. Apologies for this. Okay, just bear with me. Okay, I'm trying again. Let's see if this will work this time. So I'm clicking on full screen. Any better? No, we can see them, but not full screen. But it's fine. Go, you can go okay, ahead. Well, let's make kick off. Something is happening in the system is not allowing me to do that. Apologies. So um, yeah, there has been uh, a number of achievements relevant to to SIDS, and let me just start by talking about the the big picture and based on what Excellencies talked about in terms of the interconnectedness as well. Uh, just to say that at this stage, and not just at COP27, but really beyond that, what we're looking for is the solutions to the climate crisis in, in particular. And, and the solutions means that looking at the food and agriculture, we don't talk just about the emissions from the sectors and also 
the, uh, the various impact on, on the environment and nature, but we want to turn that around to talk more about how we can make agri-food systems an integral part of the solution to the climate crisis. Because we're talking about the transformation of agri-food systems to make them more efficient and inclusive and sustainable and also resilient to the impact of climate change. So our vision, our vision in FAO is, is very clear that we want to achieve this transformation of agri-food systems in, in order to, to achieve you know, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life for everyone, leaving no one behind. So our engagement in, in COP27 is, is really um, based on advocacy in, in promoting this solution. My apologies, my slides are, are blocked, so I can't move them, unfortunately. I don't know why. Um, you can't see the second slide, right? If you can enable content, you have a, there's a yellow warning, and if you yeah. say enable content, it should let you go ahead. It's not responding. Let me, let me try again. Apologies about this. Just, um, I don't know what happened. Apologies about this, but let me let me just just go through it. And apologies, you can't see the the slides. Um, as I was saying, um, you know, the the advocacy really what we want to to, to promote is um, you know the agri food systems to be part of of the solution that we we're aiming for. And, and the fact that, um, you know, we had a number of initiatives that we successfully launched with the, the presidency uh, in Egypt, and these cover um, a wide range of food and agricultural related initiatives, particularly uh, ones related to food and agriculture, and also on water, on nutrition, and on weight. Apologies about this. I really want to show you this slide, but somehow my system is, is blocked. Um, so, so the, this achievement has been uh, made in, in, in COP27, and we're following that up, and particularly with, with regard to uh, the relevance to the SID. So we have been providing input and, and support, both a technical and, and policy support for for SIDS uh, countries, and that's in relation to the Coronivia joint work on agriculture that recognized the importance of agriculture in, in tackling the impact of climate change. And also the follow-up to that, which is the um, Sharm Sheikh four-year work program that talks more about the, the implementation. And um, in relation to, to, the, to that, we have also been working on the initiatives that relate to the transformation of agri-food systems, particularly the FAST initiative that we launched at, at COP27. And this is going to also provide an opportunity in supporting countries at, at large, but more specifically, SIDS that will be also included in the technical and the policy support and also support for access to, to finance. Um, so these are, are some of the, the initiatives that came out there. In terms of the, the negotiations, you know, one of the, the key outcomes that we've been waiting for for, for many years is the uh, issue of loss and damage. And we're very pleased to see progress on that. In, in seeing the loss and damage fund being uh, recognized and, and agreed, and now the arrangements are being put in, in place in, in achieving that. So th this is really another element that, that uh, puts the relevance of um, small island developing states in, in the context of, of the fight against uh, a climate change. And going forward, there are a number of um, opportunities, uh, I would say, in 
putting you know seeds really at the center in in what we're trying to, to achieve in terms of support I mean, this has been recognized for many years that we want to give priorities to the most vulnerable countries and communities and i think in the current climate that recognition is increasing because of the impact that we are seeing of, of climate change and uh, an evolution in terms of, of the support i mentioned the loss and damage but also the recognition of adaptation we've been focusing a lot on uh, mitigation and reducing emissions but now we are at the stage where also the intergovernmental panel on climate change recognizes the fact that we need to give more importance to adaptation including the financing for adaptation and this is particularly relevant to SIDS because we have no choice now but to adapt to the impact of climate change we need to reduce emissions we need to remove uh, excess emissions from from the atmosphere but we also need to adapt and build resilience to the impact of, of climate change so going forward there are a number of opportunities that also provide a space if you like and and, and um you know opportunity. That, you need, that you need they're moving the slides it's not necessarily going in line with what you're saying Yes, unfortunately, I said my no, but we can, rocks and I can show. But, no, but we can see the presentation now, Situni. So oh, just say what slide you are on. Uh, apologies, I can't move it from here. No, but we can. We The PowerPoint is moving now. So just tell ah, us okay. which slides you are on. Excellent. Okay. So I'm, I'm in the slide before last. And unfortunately, I can't see it here. But well, it's good that you can see them. So someone is moving them. Excellent. So, okay, thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, this is the one. Opportunities for engagement. If you go back, if you go back, that's the one. Thank you. So for this one, I want to highlight two, two initiatives in particular, the Samoa Pathway, uh, which is the small island developing state accelerated modalities of action pathways. You can see there. And we have been engaged in this in, in supporting SIDS through you know, the policy advice and various tools and analysis that we provide for technical assistance. And the more recent one is the initiative called PLACA, which is a platform for climate action in agriculture. And this is particularly uh, for supporting countries in the Latin America and the Caribbean region. And if you move to, to the, the next slide, so here, what I want to highlight again is in terms of not just the next steps, but really the, the opportunities um, going forward in terms of um, opportunities that can provide us to engage even more and, and support the, the SIDS countries. Um, and you can see in the list here some of the uh, events coming up, particularly the Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate Summit that will be held in, in Washington at the early at the first week of, of May. Uh, also, the, the next um, UNFCCC uh, intercession in, in Bonn that will provide opportunities in, in building up from the outcome of COP27 and preparing for COP28. And the COP28 it, uh, itself, obviously, that will allow us to continue the momentum that we achieved at the last COP and do more on food and agriculture and food security in, in general. And I want to mention also um, at last the, um, the, the, the number of summits that are taking place this year, you know, the, the Climate uh, Action Summit being held in Nairobi, but also the UN Climate Ambition Summit in, uh, in New York in, in September. And in terms of, of implementation as FAO and the support that we, we, we provide, and I will finish with this point, uh, we have a number of, of strategies, and I want to mention three in particular, the strategy on climate change, the strategy for mainstreaming biodiversity, and the strategy for science, um, technology, science and innovation. And all these have action plans where we spelled out, you know, the activities that we're going to carry out to support countries. And we see these as another opportunity for us to, to support countries and particularly SIDS. So just to sum up, there are a number of opportunities that we're very pleased about in terms of the overdue support to, to SIDS countries. And we really look forward to, to continuing with this, with this in collaboration with 
a number of partners in supporting uh, more the, the countries in the siege regions. So apologies again for the slides and the system that didn't work. And I hope that you know, my intervention provided some element that you're looking for in highlighting the outcomes of COP27 and the relevance to it. Thank you again, Angelique, and back to you. Thank you, Zituni, for excellent insight on the outcomes of COP27 into the key areas of focus to further catalyze uh, climate actions. Um, one of the key takeaways from your um, from your speech is that the climate vulnerability of SIDS, and as you're aware, FAO has made a concerted effort to prioritize these countries. In this respect, I'm pleased to announce that China has committed to provide U.S. Uh, $5 million to support SIDS to accelerate the transformation of their agri sewage systems to build sustainable and resilient livelihoods through the FAO South, through the FAO China South South Cooperation Trust Fund. This trust fund aims to support developing countries to achieve sustainable agri-food systems transformation and to contribute to the implementation of the 2030 agenda, especially SDG 1 and SDG 2. We hope that the activities developed with this funding will be transformative and moreover catalytic, drawing additional funding support for SIDS. And therefore, FAO looks forward to our continued collaboration with SID governments and all partners to build a better future for all. I would now like to bring you to our next speaker, Mr. Akili Lanji Gulab. I'm sorry if I have pronounced that incorrectly. And as we've heard from previous speakers, SIDS are highly vulnerable to climate change and the resulting sea level rise. It is therefore imperative that SIDS adapt to these changes, which are having increasingly devastating impacts on the key socioeconomic sectors. Mr. Gulab, could you please share with us what Mauritius is doing to combat climate change in the agri-food sector and how the decisions of COP27 may support these efforts? Okay, uh, thank you very much, moderator, excellencies and everyone. Good morning, good afternoon and good morning wherever you are. Uh, thank you very much, the FAO team, for giving me this opportunity to share uh, what we are doing here and what could be the support required. So. Um, we are going to the next slide um, on the uh, later on the presentation. Rapidly, I will be going on seeds and climate change impact, the support and expectation, uh, what are the adaptive measures uh, in the motion context that we are doing, and some uh, indication way forward how we can uh, benefit uh, from the decision taken at the COP27. So next slide, please. So, Small island development state, we all know the uh, situation, but uh, what is uh, very important uh, to retain is that seeds are very uh, particularly vulnerable to impact of climate change, and Mauritius is among one of them. And um, next slide, please. So, uh, as a consequence of uh, the climate change, we have uh, the rise in temperature rise in sea level, change in rainfall pattern and intensity. The impact is uh, we have higher cyclone intensity, flash flood, excessive rainfall, drought condition, outbreak of pests and disease. And as such, this lead to severe losses in production, productivity, and ultimately impact on the food and nutrition security for the inhabitants. Next slide, please. Uh, the external shocks uh, also has a great influence on the potential of seeds, uh, among, uh, including Mauritius, to reach a reasonable level of self-sufficiency. So, therefore, sustainable agriculture, food production, food security program, as well as international trade are very much critical for us people to meet the SDGs, the target set, especially SDG 2. And probably this can be achieved by enhancing the capacity for storage, the reduction of food loss and food waste. Uh, Sometimes um, these can reach up to 35 to 40% of what is being produced. Strengthening of market information system, addressing land degradation, biodiversity, and even agroforestry, which can be a source 
of uh, means of production, and especially digitalization in the sector. We are talking about modernizing the uh, agriculture, production, primary production being an enterprise. So we need to move towards the uh, modern era. So now let's consider the case of Mauritius. Next slide, please. Situated in the Southwest Indian Ocean, we are uh, some 2,400 kilometers on the east coast of um, the mainland Africa. So we are particularly vulnerable to cyclone. And we uh, actually have some 10 to uh, 12 cyclone annually. So uh, the last one that we have and visited our region is Cyclone Freddy. Uh, Freddy is known to be a record-breaking cyclone, which is one of the most energetic one, the longest leaf cyclone, and many of us will recall the damage caused and the casualties caused to uh, countries such as Madagascar, Malawi, uh, and Mozambique, where we have more than 1,000 casualties and 500 uh, people missing. So. In addition to cyclone, where we have uh, considerable damage to our production, uh, both for crop and life, we have uh, regularly uh, hit with flash floods, occasional drought, pest and disease outbreak, which is uh, the, uh, associated with the rise in temperature, and uh, those calamities uh, causes uh, soil erosion, and leaching of uh, nutrients that we have. And uh, seeds like Mauritius, we have very limited arable land, so uh, we cannot uh, uh, know that uh, we, uh, our soil being depleted and degraded. So uh, what are we uh, doing here? Next slide, please. So to improve our food system, uh, we have enhanced our research activities and development for varieties that are adapted uh, to the local condition, um, varieties that are heat tolerant, and uh, varieties that can be cultivated both in open field and in greenhouses. We have uh, shifted our production towards um, protected culture and uh, grant being uh, provided for farmers to shift towards protected culture. And uh, starting in 2000, we had some 10 greenhouses and presently we have more, one, more than 1,000 and covering some 70 hectares, representing some 1% uh, of the uh, cultivable area. But the production constitute some 10 to 15% on the total production in Mauritius. We are uh, focusing on minimizing the use of chemical because highly dependent of uh, chemicals being imported abroad and uh, of fluctuation in price also. So we are moving towards uh, APM, agroecology, nature-based solution. And recently we are embarking on a project for uh, the use of seaweed to be used as an alternative for fertilizers. In the livestock sector, we are promoting the use of uh, local food uh, instead of uh, the uh, importing um, animal feed, and also uh, embarking on a project to see how uh, other source of protein can be uh, found to uh, animal feed. On the other, other side, water is being scarce, so we are favoring water saving techniques for irrigation. Uh, promoting the minimization of food loss and food waste along the value chain. As such, we are promoting post-harvest technologies and uh, giving uh, opportunities for people to do agro-processing uh, with incubation and training so that uh, we can increase the shelf life of the products. Uh, we are also promoting import substitution uh, agriculture, uh, a lot of uh, processes and um, products uh, are being imported such as rice and wheat. 
So we are promoting uh, commodities such as pulses, beans, and uh, other uh, starchy food like sweet potatoes, cassava, and uh, edos. So uh, on the other side, we are also uh, promoting digitalization for the sector. And one uh, important aspect is the empowerment of farmers. So we have our uh, farmer training school being consolidated. And um, we have also the authorities have provided a certain number of grants and loans at the uh, interest rate, which is quite low. And the grant of 50% of the investment uh, for those who embark on certain project and uh, to a certain ceiling. On the um, right side of the other screen, you'll find there is uh, a list of certain grants that the government provide to the farmers. So let's move to the next slide. We can see a glimpse of what we have been doing and um, uh, the protected cultivation uh, prevent from the flash floods, uh, temperature where they have the control environment in the, in the greenhouses, and also it minimize the entrance of pests uh, and diseases so that we use less chemicals. We also have um, the water saving technique. It's either using a gravity fed irrigation system, or we can have a solar power pump being associated with the irrigation. Uh, this uh, tomatoes give an indication of uh, one variety which has been uh, locally bred for uh, uh, tolerance to uh, heat conditions. So, uh, next slide, please. Following the uh, discussion and decision at the uh, COP27 regarding uh, food security related to seeds, uh, we, we think that uh, the FAO can provide, uh, together with the funds that have been uh, made provision for, uh, to assist in case of uh, loss and damage. And for sure, uh, every year, will have uh, this kind of loss and damage associated with the climate change and uh, natural calamities. And also we believe that uh, uh, capacity building is very important uh, to be more resilient uh, in terms both technical and financial, that is through agencies, uh, mainly through um, the value change of the food system, boosting uh, local production using indigenous knowledge and also uh, science-based um, uh, knowledge to promote uh, the local production, and also to provide support to countries to uh, uh, national level information system in agriculture. And also we believe that uh, uh, the support can be uh, focused on soil health, soil fertility, without a good health and fertility, uh, which have been degraded, uh, cannot produce optimally. So we need to restore and regenerate the soil. And also being very, uh, for, uh, being situated in the tropical condition, the pest and disease uh, load is quite high. So the management is very important. Uh, we also uh, think that uh, further development in the digital sector, uh, digitalization of the sector is very important for modernization. Facilitate marketing and trading. Uh, also to see how we can involve policy and decision makers uh, in uh, promoting resilience in uh, the production and uh, food system uh, along all the uh, value chain. So uh, the action of the FAO is not limited only at national level. We can have regional integration, uh, also inclusive uh, economy and inclusive uh, uh, situation at regional level where uh, neighboring countries can assist and promote uh, how we can uh, at least become more resilient to external shocks and natural calamities. Next slide, please. So we know that uh, the current uh, food crisis has its unique challenges requiring a food system approach that is coherent and recognize the need for mutually reinforcing 
complementary effort across geographies uh, over the short, medium, and long term. Thank you very much. Uh, it's now to you, moderator. Thank you for your intervention, Mr. Gulab, and for sharing concrete and innovative actions that Mauritius is taking to adapt to their adaptive systems to climate change, which could serve as examples uh, for other SIDs. And thank you also for some of your advice on how uh, FAO could strengthen collaboration uh, with Mauritius and other SIDs. We now move to our next speaker, Mr. Zachary Phillips, who most recently participated in the Alliance of Small Island Developing States, IOSIS Fellowship, spending a year working on supporting the interests of SIDS in the areas of climate, ocean governance, and sustainable development. Mr. Phillips, during your tenure, you were assigned to follow the loss and damage and sea level rise on behalf of AOSIS. In your experience, what are the critical areas for climate, ocean governance, and aquatic food systems to support SIDS? How can we ensure loss and damage mechanisms where SIDS can actually and tangibly access and benefit from global support? Thank you so Over much. You. Thank you so much, Madam Moderator. And thank you to the FAO for inviting me and allowing me to give my perspectives and contribute to this discussion, which I think is really important as we head towards our next SIDS conference in Antigua and Barbuda next year. Um, in relation to the question, uh, next slide, please. We've been asked, well, I've been asked to look at key, key areas of support for climate change and ocean. But I think it's really important before we look at the areas of support, we must contextualize why we need that support. So next slide. It is important and many SIDS will know that in our various international arenas, we keep harping on the special circumstances of SIDS. And this is not for um, strategy or not for lack of another way in which to negotiate. This is because this is our real experience as it relates to food security, as it relates to climate change, as it relates to ocean governance. And it is because of these characteristics that we need the supports in certain specific ways. So SIDS are generally classified according to size, remoteness, um, limited supply of national resources, and limited supply of human resources, and vulnerability to economic and natural shocks. <clears throat> Apologies. So given the time constraints, I won't go into too much detail, especially since the audience is mostly made up of persons from SIDS. But I do think it's important to go over these individual characteristics to set a bit of a cushion for discussing the COP27 outcomes. So next slide, please. Looking at the characteristic of size, as we know, many SIDS do not have vast expanses of land, so specifically particularly with food production, it is mostly medium and small scale agricultural production that happens on land. We note, however, that there are, to every small island sit, there is an equal and greater large ocean that we have control over. However, the large ocean space comes with certain difficulties in managing because of our low limited resources, whether it be human capacity, whether it be technology, or whether it be our expanse of, of the actual ocean size. Next slide. Uh, a good example would be the island of Seychelles, which, if I'm not mistaken, has an ocean space that is larger than the country of France. So despite the fact that Seychelles may be termed as a small island and its population may not be of the capacity of, for example, the nation of France, there is a vast expanse that Seychelles has the potential to tap into, but tapping into that potential has to be done within the context of the resources that are available to them. And the same can be said for many different small island states around the world. Next slide. <clears throat> Thus, in relation to size, a solution that is critical or any critical solutions that come out of these negotiations must focus on support that deals with small and medium scale farming practices rather than 
uh, re-emphasizing or repeating large-scale production practices that may work in countries that have vast expanses, but cannot work given the unique situation of SIDS. Our, our critical support must be tailored to us. As it relates to ocean governance as well, the food security concerns, aquaculture, um, any, any management of the ocean governance must take into account that the ocean expanse largely exceeds, in most cases, the land expanse and most times the human resource capability as well. So we do need assistance to govern our oceans in order to accurately secure or start production in a way that will better secure food for the citizens within. And I also take time to note at this point that any assistance in relation to ocean governance or ocean food production will have to take into account that there may be future implications as it relates to rising sea levels, uh, ocean acidification, or the effects, which is still largely unknown, of marine plastic pollution within the oceans. Next slide. <clears throat> Remoteness. Uh, as, as many of my colleagues who have already presented noted, a, a large difficulty of SIDS is our distance from global markets. So that applies not only supply chains as it relates to the actual provision of food itself, but it also affects relief, aid, assistance, and support when it is unfortunately that we are affected by adverse effects of climate change. For example, the, after the aftermath of a hurricane or a severe flood, the situation might be that the nearest support is a five hour plane flight away, or which is the case in many small island states, it is a five hour plane flight to the main island and then a three hour boat ride to the specific smaller island which may be affected. So these are critical issues that must be taken into account when we're looking at solutions going forward. Another issue with we thank you zach we'll ask you to please try to wrap up the uh, because we're running short on time apologies so. okay thank you no problem over the seven <laughs> all right so with next slide please sorry right so as it relates to remoteness solutions for SIDS have to specifically combat this characteristic by focusing on resilience resilience helps to mitigate over dependency that remoteness currently creates within a SIDS characteristic. Uh, next slide. With limited resources, I've grouped natural and, and human resources into one discussion because the same applies to both. Our resources are limited and because of our limited resources, there is a difficulty with the capacity that we have to respond, whether it be to climate action or to food security. And in this scenario, next slide, the capacity building that must be done must, must balance the fact that there is a wide range of approaches that need to be taken care of as it relates to the resources that are available to SIDS, but also in response to loss and damage effects, there is a situation that an entirety, 100% of our resources usually go into relief, where in no other situation, um, whether it be landlocked states, is that the case. Our entire GDP must be redirected now to rebuild and to get back to a state of where we were before the events happened. And noting again that these events are happening more frequently, it is quite difficult for SIDS to continue in this cycle of, of, of rebuilding. Next slide. Vulnerability, as I've said before, all of those characteristics beforehand, they interplay with each other and create a very vulnerable effect on all small island developing states. I'd also like to note quickly, noting time, that debt is an integral factor in this vulnerability as well. As it stands right now, most of the supports, whether it be, once it's not classed as humanitarian, it is classed as uh, development assistance or climate finance. And unfortunately for a lot of states, being classified as a high income country, we are unable to get concessional loans, which would mean that for Antigua and Barbuda, for example, the night before Hurricane Irma hit in 2017, we were a high income country. And the day after, we were a no income country because all of our GDP 
all of our resources were situated in rebuilding what was damaged. Next slide. Right, so in relation to a solution here, our a request or, or feature that must be critically looked upon is the provision of sustainable a sustainable solution for adequ additional, adequate, and predictable climate financing. And I'll just quickly, with the last half a minute, go over the COP27 response, if the moderator is OK with that. Next slide. We were, uh, we, this is, you know, we're a little bit over time with the, with the presentation. So if you can just say a quick, a quick line and then we can, we can close and go to the next uh, presenter. All right. Thank you very much. Um, my quick line on COP27 response is that the funding arrangements must be specific to the requirements of SIDS. It should be programmatic so that we do not go back to a project-based approach. It should be fit for purpose so that we can actually respond to what issues that SIDS themselves say that they are having difficulties with. The response and finance should be provided in a timely, predictable, and reliable manner. And ultimately, and very importantly, it should be grant-based so that we do not fall into a continually um, system of debt cycles. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Zachary, for sharing these relevant insights on the negotiations and its implications for SIDS, as for mentioning um, that we need to tailor support and what key elements need to be included in that support, as well as uh, having to take into account uh, certain important issues, such as the remoteness of SIDS and the vulnerability, which makes uh, sometimes uh, the GDP does not capture this vulnerability and uh, calling us to, to look in also to the issues of financing. Um, to conclude uh, the panelist section, I'm uh, very pleased to welcome our final speaker, Ms. Christine Müller, Policy Officer of the European Commission Director General for Climate Action, DG Klima, and responsible for climate finance in the European Commission. Ms. Müller, could you please tell us more about the Euro Com European Commission's role in enhancing climate finance and ensuring the effective implementation of the new decisions? And how is the European Commission's climate action in addressing the specific needs of states? Thank you, Angelica and Excellencies, dear colleagues. It is my honor and pleasure to participate in this fourth state solutions dialogue and to respond to your questions, Angelica. The role of the European Commission is proportional to our responsibility, experience, and capacity. And it is multi-layered. Cooperation with partner countries is the key lever to raise climate ambition globally. Here, our core mission is to build trust and comprehension for a better life in all parts of the 1.5 degree world, meeting local needs and fitting local contexts, putting those communities first that have so far been left behind. This is critical for enabling always higher and more concrete and effective ambition over time by all partners, including the advantage that more and tailor-made result-oriented solutions of support climate finance can be put in place to realize the envisaged changes. In 2021, the EU and its member states contributed 23 billion euros in public international climate finance, making up almost one third of the total amount provided that year. This makes us the largest provider in the world, and we continue to work with other countries, including those that should do much more to increase their contributions. However, we are also fully aware that our development aid alone is not enough to tackle the challenges of climate change and achieve the goals set out in the Paris Agreement. Increasing private investment is absolutely crucial in, to reach the Paris goals. The efforts needed to build adequate measures for the necessary mitigation and adaptation action is at such large scale that we must rely on a range of instruments in order to contribute adequately to these efforts. To support and accelerate the global transition, 
to a climate neutral and sustainable economy, the International Platform on Sustainable Finance has identified a growing array of transition related guidance and protocols aiming to define and direct the space. Since 2020, the EU and China initiated under the platform mentioned before a working group on taxonomies to conduct an assessment of existing taxonomies for environmentally sustainable investments, addressing commonalities and differences in respective approaches and outcomes. The common ground taxonomy aims to be used to improve the comparability and future interoperability of taxonomies. In this way, further facilitating and enhancing international climate finance including finance also for SITS. Changes at macro level are necessary as well. COP27 has been the most vocal COP in calling for reforming the global financial architecture to scale up low carbon and climate resilient investments. It highlighted that delivering the needed funding will require a transformation of the financial system, including a reform of the multilateral development banks to better serve climate and development goals. Making the cooperation platforms among these banks truly operational can bring synergies and save time and money. Their ability on risk and price discovery can be more helpful to the investors. And their global convening power and advocacy will continue to bring private and public actors together. We also welcome the objective of the Bridgetown Initiative to mobilize more finance globally to address climate challenges more comprehensively. The Global Financing Pact Summit in June will give us another opportunity to work together, developed and developing countries, strong and vulnerable across sectors and geographies, and to jointly consider the challenges. It is crucial to apply the summit's emerging findings and ideas to the largest possible contributor space, to work together, developed and developing countries, and to call for contributions from all of those that can afford it. The European Commission is fully engaged to allow for an effective implementation of the new decisions taken at COP27, including to align financial flows with the 1.5 degree objective. Changing the incentives for domestic and foreign investors require coordinated and determined action across the public and private sector. To catalyze private investors, public authorities will need to focus on creating the right enabling policies environments, providing financing and risk mitigation, setting standards and, and guidelines. Multilateral development banks will also have an important role in those developments by developing innovative approaches tailored to local needs, but also by supporting capacity building and knowledge sharing. With regard to agriculture and food, we are engaged to cooperate to work out the concrete contents of the four-year joint work on climate action for agriculture and food security, building on the outcome of the Cornelia joint work on agriculture and duly integrating the new agriculture and food related initiatives launched at COP27 by the Egyptian presidency. We believe that FAO action planning on climate, biodiversity and innovation should well mirror the four year joint work under the UNFCCC and vice versa and that together we should use the FAO-hosted UN Food Systems Summit Coordination Hub, the July 2023 global stock tanking moment in Rome, notably to make further strong cases for building climate resilient food systems, also in SITS. Such cases should give priority to help the most vulnerable address local nutritional needs and climate adaptation needs first, and then work out and implement solutions to change the supporting local land use and food system patterns. Tailor-made climate finance would be an essential part of the picture. Eventually, the PLACA platform for climate action and agriculture mentioned by Zituni also, the FAO hand-in-hand -hand geospatial information system could facilitate the setup and implementation of pilot projects to test the application, for example, of the new food system transformation mechanism introduced here into our discussion by the AUSIS chair before. Such approach could give preference to concrete agri-food climate action examples, as they were discussed here in our dialogue before, could also be interesting for implementing projects under the South-South Cooperation Trust Fund, other funds mentioned before. 
Small island developing states are indeed particularly vulnerable to climate risks. And therefore, again, we very much welcome the precious pledge by China announced before. We welcome today's dialogue in view of paving the way for further future cooperation, including on climate resilient food systems. Thank you all. And back to you, Angelica. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Müller, for the insights. It's particularly encouraging to hear how this important topic is for the European Commission and about the investments uh, that are being made uh, to support SIDS climate action. I'd also like to thank you for highlighting the opportunities uh, that we may have with the food system stock taking moment, uh, the hand in hand, the placa uh, to support SIDS. So now we have heard from all our speakers and it's now time to hear from you. Uh, the floor is open uh, for a quicker uh, question and answer panel. As I said earlier, we will accept questions from the floor in Geneva, New York, as well as from online participants. If you are online, please use the Q&A model, uh, not the chat box. Uh, to get us started and uh, break the ice, uh, we have His Excellency, Duke uh, Danivalu, permanent representative of the Republic of Fiji. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Angelica, and thank you, FAO, for convening this uh, dialogue, uh, looking at SEED's uh, solution. And let me also uh, acknowledge and uh, express appreciation to all the uh, panelists and the speakers, uh, the ambassador of Samoa in uh, New York and the ambassador of uh, Solomon Islands in, uh, in uh, Belgium. I think one of the key things that's come out very strongly to, to me in this, uh, in this dialogue is the challenges that, that SIDS face um, and the high, high vulnerability in particular that we experience. And how do we respond to that? Uh, and what are the means by which we can effectively address those challenges which are ongoing and ongoing meaning year to year? And I think that's been highlighted in all of the presentations. Uh, I mean, it's putting at jeopardy all the neat categorizations that we have come to know uh, of uh, middle-income countries, high-income countries, and I think that point has been mentioned. Uh, the fact of LDC graduation, you graduate this year, and next year you, you may as well be back to LDC status. Uh, all these neat uh, categories that we have designed and devised are now increasingly being challenged, if not uh, redundant. And what should be the response of the global community uh, to these ongoing uh, systemic uh, um, challenges that we as small island developing states uh, face? Now, we've talked about partnership, uh, and I think that's one of the solutions that we clearly have uh, in our arsenal. Um, particularly in terms of providing financial contributions. And I hadn't known about the contribution from, from China towards uh, FAO uh, in support of SIDS, which we welcome and appreciate. And I think the support of EU and other partners in, in this respect are very much uh, appreciated and, uh, and welcome. But also um, the work that the multilateral development uh, banks and financial institutions are vital in addressing uh, this um, systemic challenges that we face. And we, we acknowledge the work that Barbados uh, Prime Minister and others are doing in this regard. And I think those uh, should continue and particularly gain more traction in the um, climate change space uh, in particular, uh, but in other forums and, and uh, recently seen the meetings in uh, Washington, DC. But the actual work uh, being done by FAO, I think, is commendable in supporting SEEDS uh, to address the impacts, adverse impacts of climate change, and particularly focusing on the agri uh, food systems uh, for our countries. And I think those uh, should really continue to assist us in uh, building resilience, but in addressing some of the challenges. But I think this definitely needs a lot more uh, thorough uh, dialogue to, to see how we can assist our countries because these cycles of cyclone, they don't stop and they are becoming worse and worse. Thank you very much, Excellency, uh, and uh, thank you for your comments. 
Um, I will now uh, give the floor to Ms. Alison St. Rice, the Chargée d'Affaires at the Permanent Mission of Trinidad and Tobago to the United Nations, Geneva. Thank you, moderator, and good day to everyone. And thanks as well to all involved in the organization of this important interaction and for the extension of an invitation to make brief remarks. Uh, my delegation, we wish to thank the distinguished speakers for their informative and insightful contributions, which we believe provide a sound platform for rich dialogue on the implications of the COP27 outcomes for the agri-food systems of SIDS. On the loss and damage fund, we look forward to its effective implementation. And we also take this opportunity to highlight this important outcome from COP27, regarding which AOSIS and CARICOM demonstrated persistence and astute leadership. As a country situated in a region where extreme weather events and natural disasters have decimated our agriculture sectors and economies as a whole, we recognize the importance of effective and accessible climate finance, as well as the imperative to improve our approaches as a global community to questions related to death. For us, it would be important for COP28 to deliver where COP27 fell short, especially as relates to predictable and high ambition support and global cooperation for our implementation efforts. As an NFIDC, a small and vulnerable economy and a small island developing state, problematically classified by the existing international financial architecture as a high income economy, Food insecurity remains a key challenge that is of high priority for Trinidad and Tobago. An inordinately high food import bill remains a source of concern. And this is why, alongside other CARICA member states, we are pursuing in earnest the regional effort to reduce our regional food import bill by 25% by 2025, including by prioritizing certain crops and products, including poultry, certain meats, and niche vegetables. As we do so, we continue to situate our food security efforts within the broader framework of efforts to address challenges relating to non-communicable diseases, an issue on which Trinidad and Tobago and CARICOM have long placed the spotlight. We, have also, we also join other CARICOM member states in embracing and affirming the viability of the Bridgetown Initiative in recognition of the imperative to revamp the international financial architecture so that it is better positioned to effectively address the challenges of vulnerable developing countries, including SIDS. As we seek to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, to strengthen our economy and to sustainably feed our population, the question of access to grant and concessional financing remains a key one for us. Madam Moderator, I thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bryce. I now give the floor to Mr. Ines Duane, for Secretary of Permanent Mission of Barbados, United Nations Mr. Duane, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Excellencies and esteemed guests, good afternoon. I will be brief with my comments. Allow me to first apologize for the absence of our Ambassador Wilson, who wanted to be here, but is currently out of Geneva on official duty and therefore could not attend. We recognize and give special thanks to the FAO and relevant players in sponsoring the CIS Solutions Dialogue, which seeks to adequately assess and address the issues facing SIDS. As we sit here and listen to the wonderful presentations and stimulating discussions, we heard critical elements mentioned to ensure our food security going forward, as we know that our culture has not been shielded from climate-related issues in Barbados, the necessity to analyze and address factors such as the environmental degradation of our soils, decreasing rainfall in essential periods of the year, coupled with constant threat of rising sea levels and salt water inf infiltrating our aquifers, has made decreased access to fresh water for our farmers, for seasonal crops and livestock. Specific attention is being placed on achieving resilience of the agricultural sector to climate change and increasing capacity in agriculture. We also see the relevance to connect agricultural and tourism sectors in small islands and working with those small farmers to ensure quality, reliability of supply and new market opportunities. We all know SIDS are currently faced with factors such as adverse debt, the graduation of our economies, limited access to pertinent resources and revenue streams. 
At this stage, we see that adjusting resources and flexibilities at the international level will serve to assist in meeting those requirements to accelerate progress in safeguarding our green and blue economies. At the international level, the British Town Initi Initiative, led by Prime Minister, the Honourable Mia Motley, is a collaborative effort that seeks to provide a set of ideas to address what needs to be done to mitigate issues on climate and deal with the damage and make climate vulnerable economies more sustainable while treating to the current impact of loss and damage. In closing, let's continue to support those initiatives that can work to safeguard our future generations and maintain these types of dialogues as organized by the FAO issues facing SITS. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dwayne, for your comments. I now give the floor to Mr. Colin Lucky, uh, Second Secretary of the Permanent Mission of Guyana. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Good afternoon, Excellencies, colleagues. Um, I must say uh, thank you to the presenters. I think the, the contribution, the discussion was insightful. And Madam Moderator, I'll just brief because of the time. Uh, so I, I just want to um, share that uh, Guyana welcomes the decision to establish the Loss and Damage Response Fund from the recently concluded UN, Triple, UN Climate Conference, the COP27 in Egypt. And one of the things um, I would want to highlight that financing for sustainable development and climate, sec and climate secure future is uh, paramount uh, importance. Um, there is need for increased climate mitigation funding for small island development states and low-lying states, low-lying coastal states uh, like Guyana, because you know these countries um, they are clear for vulnerabilities to climate change. Um, I just want to quickly share that in an effort to continue mitigating climate change impacts, Guyana is pursuing a low-carbon development strategy, which aims at creating a model for uh, value, value ecosystem services and sustainably developing and managing the blue economy, investment in climate energy and stimulate low carbon growth, protecting against climate change and biodiversity loss, alignment with global climate and biodiversity goals. Um, finally, I would just want to share that um, Diana's long been a global lead in the fight against climate change. And this still, this remains, even though we, we are now um, as a new uh, oil producer and our new realities increase our ability to fully understand the challenges the international community must address, including aligning the need for climate and energy security, balancing food security with maintaining the world's forest. And at the core of everything we do, is to ensure that we act in solidarity with developing countries, especially SIDS, to progress on our priorities, especially around climate finance. I think I'll stop there. I don't want to thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I now uh, give the floor to Ms. Joni Hartman, the First Secretary of Permanent Mission of the Republic of Power. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so now we're welcoming the FAO's initiative to develop food and agriculture systems resilient to the impacts of climate change through both adaptation and mitigation measures. This is particularly pertinent as our countries simultaneously recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, which has fractured the global supply chain, impacting detrimentally on the islands that are highly dependent on food imports. To reduce reliance on food imports and address the issue of food security and improve nutrition, the Nauru government has committed to restructure its system to increase domestic food production. It is therefore timely that we start the conversation on adaptation and mitigation measures to build resilient uh, food system. To conclude, I take this opportunity to recall the United Nations Food Systems Summit and the global commitment to launch all new solutions to transform food systems by 2030, specifically to reiterate the Nauru is committed that Nauru is committed to promoting an efficient and climate resilient agriculture and fisheries sector that supports livelihood. Nauru therefore looks forward to further collaboration with the organization and partners. Bye. <laughs> thank you very much, Ms. Hartman, and thank you to everybody um, for your comments. Unfortunately, uh, time flies as we're having fun, as they say, and we are coming to the end of uh, 
of this dialogue. Um, but before closing, it is my pleasure uh, to hand the floor over to uh, Marielena Semedo, Deputy Director General of the for closing remarks. Marielena, over to you. Thank you, Angelica, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to all. Let me start by uh, thanking our presenters today, uh, the Ambassador uh, Upulu, I'm sorry if I misspell your name, representative from Samoa to the United Nations, Ambassador Moses Mose from Salomon Islands, Ambassador of Kingdom of um, Salomon Islands to the Kingdom of Belgium, uh, we have also Mr. Grulov, we have uh, Zachary, we have uh, Mrs. Christine Muller, and all the comments coming from the distinguished ambassadors um, in the room. Also, I would like to thank my colleagues uh, from uh, FAO office in New York, Geneva, Brussels. You uh, also Zituni, he was a, my, he was a panelist. And uh, to you, Angelica, for facilitating this event. It's really a pleasure to me. As several of you, I am also from small island development states. I am from Cape Verde. And uh, is really something in my heart because I share the same conditionalities that you share with us today. I know and I can measure what you are talking about regarding the, the size, of seas, the remoteness, uh, the vulnerabilities. And I think we talk all the same language. But uh, I would like also to congratulate all of us for this uh, dynamic session. Uh, this session highlighted the particular and unique vulnerability of the small island states in face of climate change. And also uh, it has been said that AUCP is working on a multidimensional index that will, I think will capture all the vulnerabilities and all the specificities of seeds and will help us move from the GDP to really what are the realities of uh, the small island development states. And we also heard how uh, climate change is affecting agri-food system, food security, and nutrition, food safety is compromising livelihoods, economic growth, the islands themselves and the future prospects. And it, it was mentioned how in the islands we have the food insecurity, the obesity, how the, it's affecting the, uh, the NDCs and how we really need to be resilient to external shocks and natural cal calamities. Uh, we also mentioned that uh, we are small in land, but you are also large ocean space. But this also bring other challenge, the governance of the, the oceans, the rising of the, the sea levels, and how we can better exploit what can come from the seas. And it was referred for the ocean food production and FAO, we are working now on the aquatic foods and we hope that the aquatic food will provide better food security to, to the islands. We also heard how coastal erosion, more frequent and extreme weather and wave impacts are contributing to food, water insecurity and soil erosion and how the agriculture sectors had been hit hardest in terms of climate disasters impact. And this, we look, uh, if we look at the figures of the statistics between 2008 and 2018, climate disasters in the Caribbean seeds um, are evaluated in 8.7 billion and the Pacific seeds across Oceania, 108 million was the dollars. Can you imagine if you have invested the, this amount in development, what it could it could mean change the, the reality in the in the seeds. 
Um, I think it's not a surprise to all of us that the message that resonated loudly during this dialogue is the urgent need for investment in capacity building, in adaptation strategies, enhanced support to transform seed agri-food systems to become more resilient, but also the need to have a more interdisciplinary approach the need to improve also the food governance, how we can have this transition to healthy foods and the transition diets, how uh, we can deal with the market, the market information, how we can link the seeds producers to the market and to the international trade, how we can reduce the food losses and waste, and how we can reimagine the food security in the lead way to San Vicente and Barbuda. Uh, we also mentioned the specific funding that was announced uh, today under the FAO and China South-South Cooperation Trust Fund, which I consider is timely and the high priority that FAO plays on the transformation of agri-food system. It also has been said that this fund, we hope it will be catalytic to bring more funds. But the, the question of partnership, financing, investment was mentioned by the majority of our panelists and the comments coming from uh, our participants. The need to have a more predictable climate finance to address, to address loss and damage, how we can better uh, catalyze private investment, what will be the enabling policies, how we can develop the multilateral development banks, how we can tailor-made climate finance. And I would like also to thank the European uh, Union here for your support to the, to the SEEDS work in FAO, the ACPS, and also generally. And we hope we can continue to work with the um, European Commission in this very strong partnership. Uh, today's discussion also provides an opportunity for seeds to share experience, exchange ideas, and how the outcomes of COP27, particularly the ones related to food and agriculture, such as the Sharm el Sheikh joint work on implementation on the climate action on agriculture, and food security, I, as I mentioned, the loss and damage agreement and the Egyptian presidency food and sustainable transformation initiative, so how they can support this transformation we aim for the, the seeds. Uh, we hope through the fast we'll be able to mobilize new and more sustainable finance. We, we will be able to develop global and regional initiatives, network, coalition, including the small island development states, accelerated modalities of action pathway, the Samoa pathway. But I think more than that, how we can work together to bring innovative uh, uh, solution to the next meeting on the seeds in uh, Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, FAO, we stand ready to work with you to a better preparation of the meeting, to come up with solutions and to speak at one voice. It has been said that we need voices from the seeds. And this, it also mentioned, the Prime Minister of Barbados has been one of the speakers on the, have been one of the voice of seeds in the international arena. We have much more and how we can put together those voices to speak as one regarding the seeds challenge uh, we face. And we hope we'll be able to bring this to Antigua and Barbuda. Um, we also partner to support seeds to access technical assistance to the Santiago network and helping develop and implement the Sharm el Sheikh joint work on the climate action on agriculture and food security. Also, I hope and I strongly believe that today's conversation will help us in the lead to COP28 in UAE and uh, to, to bring 
those ideas, those solutions, and the seed's voice to maybe more strategic and more uh, multidimensional, as it has been said, to the COP27. Let's continue working together. I think FAO can have a role on, that, on this, OECP, OASIS, all those organizations, let's work together and to have very strong messages and cases to bring to COP28. And let me conclude thanking you again for your presentation. Count on FAO. Uh, it has been a successful, this fourth uh, seed solution meeting. And let's, let's make it your solution, your meeting, and help us to scale up what we are doing, the success having in the seeds, but more than that, our vulnerability and the need to bring our measure, because as it has been said, GDP is no longer a measure for seeds. It's so volatile and from one day to another that we need to change the way we, we deal, we speak, and we measure our success and also our failures. Thank you again and hope uh, you will be able to, to meet again before the new challenge and the new meetings we are having. Thank you, Angelic, and over to you. Thank you, Marielena, for those inspiring closing remarks. Uh, um, to conclude this meeting, I wish to thank everyone online and also those of you in person in Geneva, New York. And of course, thank you very much to our distinguished speakers for your participation and for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Um, there's been a number of questions in the Q&A chat box, which unfortunately we, we run over time, um, but we will be addressing them uh, in, in writing soon. Uh, lastly, have a nice rest of your day or evening, depending where, wherever in the world you may be. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.